there's this great article in the Philadelphia Inquirer. Uh, and thank you, Alan Orr, uh, whose family who sent it. Uh, well, actually, he shared it on, on Twitter. Um, and it starts, Arlene Blackstone remembers the short white man who came to her grandmother's North Philadelphia door at the time, at the same time, every few weeks to collect her $5 life insurance premium. Uh, Arlene said sometimes he would sit down and have a cup of coffee. Most of the time, the transaction took no longer than 10 minutes. Her grandmother always paid in cash and the man would take the money, write a few words in his notebook and be on his way. That was the routine for 35 years until Blackstone's grandmother made transition. Her name was Mary Ann Young. She passed away at the age of 84 in 1992. The policy Ms. Young had paid for, paid into for more than three decades, added up to a whopping $5,000, and it barely paid for her burial. And then Ms. Blackstone said there's nothing left over. She's oh. a retired Verizon IT project manager. Blackstone 76 now learned from that experience and she purchased two policies, one through her job, one on her own with the intent to make sure she left her three sons a financial legacy. She said, I want them to have more than enough to bury me. Today, African-Americans are more likely than their white counterparts to look to look to life insurance to cover their final expenses. Yet white families have significantly larger policies than their black counterparts, even when income levels are the same. While Pennsylvania was the first state to agree to the gradual abolition of slavery, these financial institutions, known as insurance companies, quietly profited both directly and indirectly off slave product, pr produced commodities, and sometimes even the very lives of the enslaved themselves, because that cargo that carried those shackled Africans to auction were often insured. Actually, Black people invented the insurance industry. Our bodies produced the insurance industry. And after the Civil War, cities expanded. The industry boomed. Life insurance industry shifted to meet the growing class of working class people that came into the country to safeguard and support families. And an internal sub survey conducted in 1881 by Prudential, which is in my backyard of New Jersey, found black mortality rates were 50 percent higher than white mortality rates. And a testament to the legacy, of course, Jim to Jim Crow and slavery. So the company started to raise the premiums. So it cost black folks uh, three times more in some cases to get life insurance. MetLife did the same. All the companies participated. Yep. And now that it is out there, you know, the question is, what is black life worth to insurance right. companies? And so I wanted to talk with you a little bit about that, because, you know, I frequently have on insurance folk, you know, like Harry Harris and others, of course, Cousin Sil used to be on talking about this very thing. And it is yep. so important um, that we insure ourselves. What, what are your thoughts, Allie? Well, there are a couple of things that you talked about that uh, MetLife uh, or Prudential uh, survey that was done in 1881, where they found that uh, mortality rates amongst black people was higher, was substantially higher than among uh, white people. Obviously, in 1881, think about this, right? Black people were, would not have been expected well into the 1880s, 1890s, 1920s, 1930s, right, where they were still, in most cases, sharecropping and working until the end of the year for no money. The only distinction was that you were not not uh, the property of someone else, but there was still no money to be had, no wealth to be had, which meant no money to be spent on recreation, no money to be spent on health care. Uh, and, and so black people died at a rate much faster than uh, white people or, or much lower. And the insurance industry works off of averages and things like that. So they said, well, if black people are going to die younger. The point of selling somebody a policy like that story you started with is that for 35 years, a guy comes and takes the premium. You want somebody to live for a long time. So they put more into the pot. So they started increasing rates for uh, black people and lowering the amount that people were covered for. And what happened for a lot of black people is what they wanted to do was at least have enough that their funeral expenses would be covered, their burial expenses, maybe a little bit to get people through that. So they started selling uh, lower value policies to black people and some white people they were called industrial policies. But, but ultimately, what it turned into was a version of redlining, right? It turned into a version of if you're black, you're policy, your premium might be more and your coverage might be less. And it just became an acceptable thing to be able to determine that race in this particular case, being black, will determine uh, certain things about your policies. That was soon made illegal in a lot of places, but it still continues. It is still the kind of thing that people can do. The, the insurance companies will argue it's statistical. If you're black, uh, Karen, you are more likely to die earlier than a white person is. So in order to insure you, we have to charge you more or give you less insurance. 
it's 2022. We can figure out what everybody's life expectancy is. We can figure out your particular things. We can send you for a medical test. If you're over 40 and you try and get life insurance, almost always will you have to go for a medical test. The only exceptions are when you get it through your employer that you can often get a certain amount of life insurance without a medical test because your insurer, your employer has um, negotiated a rate. But the fact is, like redlining, like like black people earning less uh, for the same work that they do than white people. This is another one of those aspects where black people want insurance. They would like life insurance. They're actually insured at a higher More black people are insured than white people are for life insurance, but not for as much value. So more right. black people have life insurance than white people, but white people have more value in life insurance for lower premiums payable than black people. So it's just one of those basic unfairnesses that actually can be fixed because we are in a data-driven society. I can, I can't, but one can figure out exactly what your risk factors are for life insurance, Karen, and we can evaluate and give you a policy that's based on you, not the color of your skin or your race. I remember having to get key man or key woman insurance when I was given a million dollars to start a company. And right. I was like, oh, this is interesting. You know, you know, they they insured me, you know, because during that same period, if you remember Urban Box Office, their their founder, uh, George, died and that they had gotten, yep. I think, like 50 million dollars. And the whole basically in two years, the company was done, right. you know, because the key man left. And if it were insured, I'm sure they would have had enough to, to continue. Correct. Um, but no one expects to leave, you know, this earth in their 30s and 40s. Correct. But that's why you get insurance. But, you know, I was thinking about this because for me, insurance is a financial vehicle as well. It is a way to, you know, uh, you know, there's different kinds of insurance, but you can use it as a financial tool, something yeah. you can borrow against, something that you can, you know, I just went through this whole thing because I'm single. I, I, I want to make sure I have enough money when I'm 100 that you know, I don't want to be at anybody's mercy. Correct, right. So I want to make sure that, you know, I can have somebody come around the clock if I need to yep. and, you know, feed, bathe, clothes, you know, do all of the good things that I need done and do yep. them well at the highest level. But, you know, all that has to be planned for when you're yep. young. Yes, because if you're 65 and you start planning for the fact that you're going to live to 100 and you might need 24 hour care, guess what? No matter what your color, they're going to charge you a lot of it, it, about insurance. So the one good thing is that Black people in America have a history of getting insurance at an early uh, age, which is actually good, but they've been subject to unfairness in the process, and that continues. But it is a yes. tool, and I think that's important for people to remember, Karen, that it's it, it, insurance is complicated. We don't talk about it all the time, so people don't know, do I get term insurance? Do I get whole life insurance? W what are the kinds of things I can do, and how do I figure out what premium I want, and how much money do I want it to be able to pay out? Is it for when you're living to be older? And there's no one to take care of you. If it, by the way, if you're a, if you were in a pair, if you're in a pairing, a coupling, you know, you live to 95 years old. One in two people is going to have Alzheimer's, so they're going to need caregivers for that. Is it for your kids? Is it for college education? Is it short term or long term? These are all sophisticated conversations that people need to have. So I, I have to say, I'm a person. I have insurance. I think insurance is a good idea. But as we learn about these things, we learn about these redlining examples where. It, it, even insurance, which should be all statistical and, and mathematical, is not fair for black people. When did you who told you about getting insurance? Was it just part of your, you know, your financial upbringing? Your house? So I, you know, okay. I, I sort of was in on that <laughs> personal finance world. And it's it's sort of advanced level personal finance, right? The basic personal finance is budgeting and saving. And then it's investing in the stock market and using index funds and things like that. And then once you have that kind of stuff, then you make sure you got a will and and then you think about, well, if you're getting a will, that means you've thought about your mortality. And at that point, who pays for it when you die? I mean, one of the reasons this industrial insurance became a big thing for families in general, but for Black families in particular, is because Black families, no Black family in America virtually had the chance to build wealth before the 1930s, 1940s, um, and, and the Great Migration, right? There was no wealth. You, you, you spent everything you had because that was the way sharecropping worked. Somehow, at the end of the year, you owed as much for coffee. I'm going to pause. I'm, I just, I'm going to put up, I'm putting up a church finger, Allie, yeah. because we don't talk enough about this. And I think we should. Yeah. I think, though, you know, what you're saying is not wrong, but majority of black folk were, were sharecroppers or domestic workers. 
but there were absolutely thriving communities, at least 19 of them that were decimated in the early 1900s, not yep. 1930s and 40s, in the early 1900s. We're and I'm not just Greenwood talking about Greenwood. I'm not yep. talking about Rosewood. I'm not talking about Eatonville. I'm not yep. talking about Wilmington, North Carolina. I'm not, you know, I, like, I can go on. This, yep. The red summer of 1919 decimated yep. a whole lot. So there were there were communities there were that wealth. were. Yes. Yes. And not, was, not just some black wealth, like North Carolina was, you know, a model state in terms of black power and wealth. We talk a lot about Tulsa, which we should. But yep. Tulsa wasn't, there's Rentersville in Oklahoma. Yep. There were like a handful of black You're 100% communities right. outside that, of Tulsa. It, it's true. it was not as widespread, but it was there. Uh, there were there were black people who owned uh, small enterprises, small businesses, and, and they were very, very successful. Some of it on the strength of other black people in the community supporting them, and some of them not. Some of them were actually doing things that were more widespread, including uh, newspapers and general stores. But ultimately, wait, 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 wait. I just I'm, I want to sit here for a second because if we, we can't gloss over it. And, you know, I was just having this conversation last night. I was talking about Ida B. Wells because she's over my shoulder on yep. both sides. Yep. And, you know, part of her launch into fighting um, or not fighting, being a journalist around lynching was like most lynchings happen because black people were being uppity because black people had the audacity. So it started with a grocery store. Right. The people's grocery store yep. that was more successful than the white grocery store across the right. street. And the white folk got mad and came in and shot the man. The man shot back. They got shot. And then that turned into a whole burn down the grocery store yep. and create, you know, death and havoc. And this was actually more the playbook. So it was the success that led to the violence. It was the success. It was it was not jump, not jumping off the curb or having the audacity to have an amass wealth. So I don't know, Ali, if 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 that story is told enough, because if the if the disincentivization of wealth is, you know, if I get wealthy and successful, somebody's going to come and take it. Malcolm X's father, the audacity to go out and organize people, Meg Evers, who was an insurance salesman who decided to go out, had his own home, did all this. And said, I'm going to organize people to vote yep. shot blocks away by a coward. Yep. But every time there was any kind of movement and progress and success around freedom, right. justice and money. Here comes the white horde of zombie evil doers. Yeah. And, and, and we don't you're right. We don't talk about it enough. We started talking about it a bit in a very mainstream way in the last presidential election in the primaries, because for, for whatever reason, a number of the Democratic candidates realized that this long-term re-equalization of people in terms of monetary value, whether it was baby bonds or education or uh, historically black colleges and universities, or as uh, uh, Michael Bloomberg called it, the, I think he used Greenwood in the name of his project for black empowerment, right? So there were everybody started talking about this because everybody wanted black votes, by the way, to become the, the Democratic nominee. But it became a more sophisticated national conversation than I have heard in a long time. People came up. Cory Booker had some very interesting suggestions. Elizabeth Warren did. Uh, Michael Bloomberg had most of the big city former and current black mayors in the country actually supporting him on a on the basis of sort of black economic empowerment. Uh, and, and Joe Biden did, too. So I do think there's a lot more to be said about it. There's obviously stuff that's been put into popular cultural about, uh, about it now. But people don't know these stories and they don't know about the second time that black wealth was lost as clearly as it, it should be uh, articulated in the in the 80s in America. So in the end that there is black wealth in America today, it has had to overcome not just the normal obstacles that everybody has to overcome, like recessions and, and things that happen across the country, but very specific things that targeted the black community. Bottom line, though, is that there now is potentially wealth to pass on, right? And and not enough because we we still know that black owned homes are not valued at the same level that white owned homes are, even if it's the same kind of uh, house, even if it's the same actual house, by the way, we know that if a black person selling a house, they won't get the same offer. So there's a, there is a sophisticated level of thought around this. Dr. Andre Perry does a lot of it. Dorothy Roberts at Penn does a lot of it is about how we actually fix these things. And there's a way to do it. There are recipes for actually doing it. The idea of baby bonds for college was a sophisticated idea. So we are getting there. And when you talk about whether it's insurance or these kinds of policies, what we are, have arrived at in 2022 is the idea that in the next period of time, if we commit to this on a political level, we can actually start to make up for lost time for Black families who were not able to either build up or sustain or keep the wealth that they had 
or for those who never got the opportunity to build up that wealth. I think there are a lot of Americans who forget that from the end of slavery through to sort of the end of sharecropping, most Black people were not able to, or until, until the beginning of the, the, the Great Migration, many Black people most actually were not able to build up enough wealth to pass on to the next generation or acquire property. And had they been able to do that since the end of slavery or since the beginning of the country, the Black situation economically in this country would be very different than it is today. I wish this was a case of people not knowing versus not wanting to, to know I or care. Both. I think it's both, though. I, I, I think, I think they don't know like- because they don't care to know. I think they don't know because they don't care to know because caring to know yeah. would prevent you from banning books and being mad uh, about I, CRT. Which is, you know, so so there's there's a there's a not just a disconnect. There's a visceral reaction, violent reaction to anything that might possibly even the playing field, because in their minds, equity means something is being taken away from them. It's well, oppression. Look at the 1619 Project, right? Like, yeah, all it was a book telling you about a date that you might not have right. thought about. It didn't take anything away from anybody and, and, and people lost their minds about right. it. Well, nobody asked for any money. Nobody asked to reallocate wealth. Nobody asked for anything. They just said, could you think about this date when some black people came to America? And it, it made everybody crazy. But I will disagree with you in that I think people don't know what they don't know. They don't even know some of these stories, right? So when Bloomberg decided, and I, I didn't think Bloomberg was the right candidate for president, but when he decided to call it the Greenwood Project, I think it was a project, whatever he called it, Mm-hmm. It made people Google it, made people understand, made people tell stories about these things. I think people don't really register. There are a lot of people who thought, hey, the end of slavery, why couldn't Black people just make it the way white people could? Well, because of life expectancy, because of no health care, and because of the fact that for 40 years thereafter, most people still couldn't make more money. The end of bondage was not the beginning of prosperity for a lot of Black people. And and I mm-hmm. think, I'm, I guess I'm just giving people more of the benefit of the doubt that if it, if they were exposed to more of it, uh, fantastic books like The Warmth of Other Suns, they would say, wow, now I, I get this, that this is an institutional, political, societal challenge that we can undo now. The Warmth of Other Suns, The Half Has Never Been Told. I mean, right. there's, you know, there's, there's, there's great books on this. Yeah. The, the, yes. The, the, but they're big books, right? They're really good books to take yeah. a long time yeah. to read. They're really gotta big read. in the world where people yeah. don't read one book a year. Is. What is that? What is that even? Well, I understand, you know, it is, um, but listen to it on audio while you're taking your jog. Oh, you don't jog. Yeah. I yeah. tell people all the time, it's like, just read some of these books. It won't change your world, but it'll change your worldview about things. It'll just help you understand things you never understood because popular culture doesn't teach you this stuff. The color of money. Yes, yeah. all of that, MRSA. Uh, 866-801-8255. Ali Velshi is here. You can check him out at Velshi. Saturdays and Sundays, 8 a.m. Eastern, and the last word, Friday nights at 10. I know some of you are boycotting because of Tiffany Cross, and I support that. However, uh, Allie, that's why I bring Allie on the show. (laughs) I may not be tuning in, bro, but I'm definitely going to watch your clips and click on it because I think that um, these are places where we need to build bonds and bridges and and figure out ways to work together to to form a more perfect union because i i, I actually right. am optimistic that is possible but it requires something of us um the rail rate uh, railway that we were just talking about that with pam keith yep. um the senate has agreed to uh avoid the strike yep. um which we thought that was going to happen now what about the seven days uh that the house put in of sick leave i don't know if that's going to pass what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I, look, I, I, you know, this is actually sooner than I expected this to get resolved because the, the potential strike would have been December 9th. I think they were ready to start. So this is actually, for once, everybody's given themselves a, a, an extra few days to sort things out if it doesn't get passed. Uh, look, I, I don't know if it will either. I've stopped guessing about what the House and the Senate will actually get done. I mean, they passed this uh, this act about uh, marriage and, and, and uh, you know, supporting gay marriage the other day with more than 60 votes in the Senate. So I, I never know what's going to happen. That was right after Donald Trump had dinner with a white supremacist uh, Holocaust denier. So I never know how things are going to You mean Kanye? Go. Oh, no. I'm sorry. The, the, the other dude. No, no, I know. <laughs> Kanye is complicated. Uh, but, is he, uh, though? Is he? Is he? I promise I wasn't going to mention his name. Let me apologize. Passing day. Let's put it that way. It's not like it's all become very predictable with him. Um, yeah. But at least Lots we knew he had a relationship with uh, with Donald Trump. The fact that he doesn't know who this white supremacist Holocaust denier is, is, is just implausible. 
Um, but as the, for the, best, wait, the best thing that came out of that, though, is that he asked he he said suggested that Trump should run as his running mate as his vice president. And he put out an ad where he, which yeah. he said it, which I thought was kind of. Yeah, fascinating. Uh, those guys are two peas in a pod. They uh, they, they, they deserve they, each they other. Should be the vice president and president of some country, just maybe not ours. Not a how about not a country? How about where where do the hobbits live? <laughs> not only do they deserve it, where where was Gollum? You know that they should go there where the I mean, underworld. It is a little weird though, right? That that Karen, you and I are actually talking about this. Like, what a weird thing that Donald Trump hangs out with Ye, and Ye's. I, I don't know what you, what you say about him. He's just he he's just an interesting character. He's not uh, interesting. I understand that he's got real struggles, and I and I'm I'm sympathetic to it. But having real struggles does not license to do the stuff that he does and say the stuff that he says. I know people with mental health issues yeah. and they don't do this. So I think that right. first of all, it's a disservice to anybody that's actually suffering with that. This is not mental health. This is a cry for attention. Uh, this is somebody that's just saying any old thing to see what what can happen to stay relevant or just keep people saying right. his name. He likes it. He's a contrarian. Which is you exactly know, like uh, the guy he was having dinner with, right? Yes. And the they're narcissists like and it's all about them and no. they've never been told no and they're spoiled and they're tiny and they have small penises, both of them. So it's all of that. Ali and don't engage, but I happen I'm to know. Engaging. All right, not personally, but we know for a fact that Trump has a toadstool as a penis because us, a porn star told us. And we also know because Kanye was envious of Pete Davis's member, Pete, whatever his name is, Pete's member, Skeet, whatever he was calling him. He was very like, I can't believe my wife. So that you just told on yourself, basically. Now we all know. Now we all know. <laughs> like how all your right. mind works. Yeah. I mean, you know, these these things. And then the reason why the same sex marriage thing passed and you were shocked about it is because for the first time, the number that has passed a million. There are more same sex married people than there are. They outnumbered the unmarried folk out same sex uh, to, to the tune of a million. So it's almost like oh, how Obama had to switch up, you know, the numbers. T- this is why we have to show up numbers. And all of these fronts in Louisiana to vote and stuff, because numbers matter. I was just telling my students. Yeah, this, and so. you know, uh, Rob Portman of Ohio, right? He didn't support the stuff in the past. And then he had a, a, a kid who came out as gay. And God bless him. That that changed his view. I, I'm not against that, right? Because some people get mad at, oh, you you were, it wasn't relevant to you until it was personal. I get it. We should not think of these things. We should be able to think in the abstract, right, about people's rights. I, I, should, I should support abortion rights. Not because I need to get an abortion, because I'm not likely to need one, although it's 2022 stuff changes. But but I'm OK with the idea that somebody comes around to it because they need it. I mean, Herschel Walker has availed himself of uh, of abortion services. So that's good. If he comes around to being a supporter of abortion uh, because he's used the services, uh, I'm OK with how you get there. So with the, the this 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 uh, same sex marriage stuff, I think it's actually fine. That a bunch of Republicans got there in ways that were um, not normal or not not the normal course of events. It wasn't about thinking about human rights and believing that gay people should have the same rights that we all have, but maybe it was just about believing somebody you know should have the same rights you have or your child. I'm good with however you get there as long as you get there. Yes. And this is why I think every miscegenation, that's why I'm not mad at miscegenation. Everyone Let's brown this whole mother down. Let's brown it down. Everybody be brown. And it makes it really tough. Makes it really tough. I've had a lot of callers. My grandbaby is black. And I, you know, so as a result now, I'm no longer a racist. Right. Whatever, whatever Whatever, gets you there. That's how you got there. That's cool. Shoot. All right. You ready to take some calls? Ali Velshi's here. Host of Velshi on MSNBC, 8 a.m. Eastern Saturday and Sunday. Hi, Carl in Virginia. Welcome. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you for taking my call. Uh, I just had to call in uh, because I was listening to the comments that Mr. Velshi was making about his, uh, I guess, his giving uh, white people, I guess, the benefit of the doubt when it comes to education. And no, a thousand times no. Uh, it's not that they don't, that they just don't know and they're acting out of ignorance. This is willful. This is, this is deliberate. I'm here in Virginia. I'm originally from North Carolina. There are so many things that white people have deliberately kept out of the school books on purpose. And even when they tried it, when they would write things about slavery, they would put it in the most uh, aggrandizing light for them. It's still to this day, 2022, it is still the same. So it is not that they're acting out of what they don't know. They are making a conscious decision to ignore their own past because they don't want to have to face it. And when you have these people come on, they're always giving people the benefit of the doubt. But when we when we pull the string, we see that this is systemic and it's been going on for centuries in this country. 
Uh, Carl, hang on a second. I, I, first of all, I think, thank you for that comment. I, I think you can hold both thoughts at the same time, right? I, I do a banned book club every weekend. And I totally agree with you because the people who are banning these books have not read these books. They just don't want the threat of whatever that book might have. They're scared that it's going to make their children gay or black or, or, or it's going to change their history or make their children feel uh, guilty. But I will, the distinction, Carl, is that I, I think not everybody's in the same boat. I think some people are in good faith unclear about this country's history, in good faith, unclear about the history of Black people in this country and the history of white supremacy in this country, and other people are not. Other people absolutely don't want that information getting out to other people and don't want it changing and don't want redress for that stuff. But I, I think it's unfair, Carl, to, um, to, to, to paint everybody with that brush. So in fact, I do give a lot of people the benefit of the doubt, and I hope you don't think that I should be uninvited from the show for doing it, but I appreciate you calling me out. <laughs> <laughs> and and challenging me on it because because that's 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 a discussion we should have. I mean, this is um, I I invite people on because I want to have discussions and you know we don't have to agree, we just have to respect one another and our disagreement and be open to seeing things, you know maybe that we haven't seen before. I've been pondering this question: Are these people hateful? Are they hateful, or do they just not get it? As far as I'm, you know, because we're so polarized and I know I'm right, but I know that they know they're right and we can't both be right on this. Right. No, so we, you all have to vote. That's the problem. Right. right. So we, how, we how do we going to vote? I don't know how we meet in the middle because I can't be convinced that that person, that Donald Trump is not a racist and yeah. horrible. There's nothing you can say. And I'm not trying to, you know, well, find the good in him because there's too much harm potentially with him having power that I'm not I'm not going to ever back down. Uh, but I think but neither bad, are they. that falls into the category that Carl's talking about, right? That's bad faith. That's that that there's some people who are bad faith actors. Do Donald Trump's not unsure that he had dinner with a Holocaust denier. But I think for a lot of people in this country, it's fear. It's not hate. It's fear. It's all over the world. It's fear that they will take over. They will change things. They will marry your children. They will make you black and they will make you gay. Right. It's it's this fear that politicians prey on. And people need to be informed. And instead of reading books like you and I just talked about, we have social media, which is, I use social media a lot, but it, it, it does make for a dumb society, right? It's making mm -hmm. us dumber on a daily basis because it gives us pithy little things that we can repeat that are not actually useful to solving any problems in society. So that's my problem. We have a less informed electorate on a, on a yearly basis and our democracy depends on a more informed electorate. So that's, Carl and I are not disagreeing. I just think a whole lot of people are actually not informed because Lots of people are not informed. They just don't read books. And, and wow. social media makes us dumber by the day. And isn't isn't that a choice too, Ali Valshi? Don't we know we should eat vegetables and read and know stuff? Sure. So if we don't do it, that's also I, I don't think we should get make me a racist. Off the hook. It doesn't make me homophobe. It doesn't make me uh, any of those things, right? If I didn't read the book to tell me what I'm supposed to do, if I didn't read a, a thing about how to But you're judging ally, people based on your bad. ignorance. And 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 if you're in a position of power and you happen it's to be Lauren Hobart or somebody bad. who never reads. That's, it's that's bad to revel in ignorance. It's bad to revel in ignorance, but it doesn't make you a bad person. It's just bad for you. It's bad for society. It's bad for democracy. I. That's why you and I do what we do, right? We talk to people. We go out there. We tell stories because we think however you consume it, I will tell you a story. And I'd like to be reliable and assure you that what I tell you is, is the truth. All right. But it's still a choice. I don't know that not I don't know that ignorance equals bad person. Ignorance equals racist. Ignorance equals homophobe. I think ignorance equals ignorance. Okay. And it could show up as all of those things to the person but that's in That's right. Okay. I'll, I'll accept that.